Hey everyone, what's good? It is BQ. This is the Impact Lounge. It is the number one channel for the Impact Wrestling fan. If you're first time here, we're, we're fresh off Impact Wrestling's pay-per-view, Hard to Kill. Great pay-per-view. If we're fresh off the pay-per-view, if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button. This is the number one place for the Impact Wrestling fan. Impact Wrestling podcast, reviewing the show, reviewing the news, everything going on in the company. So this was supposed to be a live stream here on YouTube, if you if you guys have been following me for a while, you know how technical difficulties go with me and happen once again. So I wasn't able to live stream. All good, all good, all good. We're going to get into the results here of the pay-per-view. Now, we're going to do a full Hard to Kill review on the Cool Factor podcast uh, over the next day or so. But, but I'm going to give you some quick uh, quick thoughts on the pay-per-view. Uh, my longtime listeners, of course, are going to be interested to hear what I have to say. And I'm interested to hear what you have to say as well, so we're going to run into, uh, excuse me, run down the results real quick, and then uh, you know stand by for the full show review in a couple of days. And again, this is the number one place to be for Impact Wrestling fans, so please uh, consider hitting that subscribe button. Give a thumbs up if you enjoyed the Hard to Kill pay per view. Now, the first thing I want to say about the pay per view itself: if you did not like this pay per view, or if somebody in your Twitter feed was watching Impact for the first time and didn't like this pay per view, they are just hating, straight up. Now we've said that this th we've said this before about some of the pay per views of the past. You know, Slam Anniversary a couple years ago, um, uh, uh, some of the Impact Wrestling episodes over the past. But this pay per view right here, to me, was their best pay per view in several years. I thought Bound for Glory was okay. I thought Slam Anniversary was pretty good last year. I think it was a little more overhyped than what it actually delivered. But this pay-per-view right here, with a build that was very focused about of, of Josh Matthews name dropping Kenny Omega twenty times an episode, and uh, you know the rest of the the rest of the feuds kind of getting you know minimal minimal screen time because then it got broken up with a couple best of episodes, and I was sitting here thinking how good could this pay-per-view really be because in, in a sense the 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 build was kind of rushed. I didn't think it was rushed. Looking back at it, there was a lot more long-term storytelling, a lot long-term booking that made the matches make sense once the pay-per-view rolled around. So for me, this pay-per-view was an A+. Let's talk about the commentary first, Josh Matthews and D'Lo Brown. Beautiful. It was like listening to another show. It was like watching another company. This was so different than the Josh Matthews stuff. I thought the last pay-per-view, I guess I was bound for glory... I thought Josh and Don just did the shittiest job on that pay-per-view. And um, this is just such a breath, breath of fresh air to me. You guys know I wasn't a fan of the direction Josh Matthews was trending as a commentator, even though I like him. And uh, Don Callis, to me, was is the worst color commentary, commentator I've ever heard. Um, and then Madison Rain, I thought, did a pretty good job. But this here, that they were the, the commentary for this show was amazing. And uh, I'm really excited going forward. It was, it was just so fresh, just just a breath of fresh air. So, uh, real quick, the pre-show was Brian Myers versus Josh uh, Alexander. I missed about half of it. I like both these guys a lot. Uh, Brian Myers gets the win. Josh, don't don't get it twisted because big things for Josh Alexander are in the future. I mean, this guy is a blue chipper. He's a star uh, with Ethan Page out of the picture now. Big things for Josh Alexander. So Brian Myers did get that win. The opening match of the actual pay-per-view was the reformation of Decay, Rosemary and Crazy Steve versus Caleb with a K and Tennille Dashwood. Um, this felt so right, folks. Seeing Crazy Steve as a member of Decay, I mean, it felt so right. He came to the company, maybe returned to the company a year or so ago. I don't exactly remember. Uh, but I've, I've, he's not the same. Decay Crazy Steve is so much better than the like the clown with the monkey, you know. And uh, this just felt right. Uh, I feel like they're they they kind of reformed Decay a little bit because we don't know if Ty Valkyrie is going to be around uh, past this match. We we really don't know what her future holds with the company, so they had to find something else for Rosemary to do. And this is perfect. It just felt right, and it, it became kind of reminiscent of the the later days of the TNA. Day, the later latter time of the TNA days that, that we miss. Because when Scott and Don came over, 
yes, there's a lot of good things they they have done, but the company lost its identity in, in certain ways from the TNA. The, the you know the TNA days of not of old but of, of recency. You know, the company will remind you that AJ Styles is still was a part of the company and all that shit and Abyss and Samoa Joe, all these dudes. But but the TNA from like 2015, 2016, 2017, like some years that we hardcore fans did really enjoy, like they've lost the identity from those days. So it felt really cool um, getting Decay there. Decay got the win. Uh, I don't think anyone expected anything different. Uh, but I really love Tennille Dashwood and Caleb with a K. But uh, this, ma- this match was awesome. Uh, so the next match was Diener, Eric Young, and, um, and, and Joe Doring. Uh, Violent by Design is a name they've come up with, which is awesome because branding is very important. Uh, they took on Cousin Jake, Tommy Dreamer, and Rhino. You guys know how I feel about Tommy Dreamer. And, you know, still wrestling after all these years on Impact and taking up spots on a pay-per-view that didn't initially have Moose or Ace Austin in it. Um, I, I have nothing bad to say about this match, folks. Like, I had no interest in old, old school rules. I, I never have interest in that. I never have interest in Tommy Dreamer on my screen. But this match was uh, this was good. And the reason those matches, they're, they're just silly to me. They start pulling out the, the, you know, the cake pans and shit like that from under the ring. And like, it's, not, it's not hardcore to me. It's just, it's just silly. What's crazy is that it took breaking up the Deaners to give the Deaners something meaningful to do on a pay-per-view. Crazy. They, they, you know, they've been around for a while. I love the Cody Deaner stuff. He... He is great in this role. I hope that they get out of the cousin Jake thing. They get rid of that music, which I never liked, and he, you know, he's Jake something from the Independence or something different. You know what I mean? But this match uh, was was good. Uh, when when this match was over, I knew we had a good pay per view on our hands because this was the one where I was kind of like, uh, I don't know what we're gonna get from it. Really delivered. Um, Fire and Flava. That is uh, Kira Hogan and. Tasha Steeles, they took on Havoc and Nevaeh. So this is the finals of the Impact Wrestling Knockouts Tag Team Tournament. Uh, there was some good and bad with this tournament. I thought it should have um, felt a lot bigger than it than, than it was. But uh, this was the finals that I think a lot of people expected. People really felt that Tasha and Kiera deserved to be in this finals and deserve, deserve to win the championship. And sure enough, that's what happened. Uh, they they were rebranded. Um, fi- get, branding is great. You got to have good branding, fire and flavor, and they won the tag team championships. Really good touch having Madison Rain and Gail Kim come down and present them with the belts. Former Knockouts champions, former Knockouts tag team champions. Like this was a really good touch, and they didn't do anything you know silly to where they you know disrespected or whatever. Like you could see, uh, it, it was all love from the ladies, and there was even some from some. Uh, you know, emotion with Tasha Steeles on her face. So, really good stuff. Um, Ace Austin came out. So, if you guys missed the pre-show, you know, he's talking about why am I not in this pay-per-view. I don't know why he wasn't. Uh, he Ever since Bound for Glory, he was kind of like missing in action. He shows up and he says, you know, you're not going to get in this X Division match. He's carrying that cheap trophy around. You're not going to get in the X Division title match. But I have a opponent for you who's always ready. Matt Cardona comes down. So, you know, as Impact fans, we're always quick to be, oh, we're so excited this guy showed up, and then we never see from him again. Or it's, it's a, you know, it's a couple matches, and then they're gone, and they sign somewhere else. Uh, when James Storm showed up at Bound for Glory, people were like, oh, James Storm is back. I'm like, dude, James Storm is not back. I promise you he's not back. That dude has been clear that he wants to wrestle in the WWE. I'm going to assume a little bit different with Matt Cardona. Now, I didn't initially have interest in him coming over to Impact because he did. He had a five-match deal in AEW. I think it was five matches. He had said he wanted to be there for the long haul, and uh, that wasn't the case. He uh, he wasn't there for the long haul, and but I think he did want to be there. Maybe they couldn't come to terms. I don't really know, but he, he you know he's not there. Uh, he did not sign there full-time. So I'm, I'm quick to not want those kind of people in Impact. But I do think that this is not a one-off. I don't know if it's a long-term deal. It, you know, it's probably still probably something kind of short-term. Um, 
but you don't you don't come you don't show up at the pay per view. It wasn't an open challenge, but it was a surprise appearance. You don't show up and, and, and get a DQ finish in four minutes. You know what I mean? So um, he's a deceivingly big guy. I think in WWE, in the in the you know just they have so many huge wrestlers there, and then the ring's big and everything. Like you think he's like almost a light heavyweight type of dude, and he he's a big dude. I, I noticed that on AEW actually when he showed up there. You know. Um, but he wins the match by disqualification. I don't think this is the last we're going to see from him. And I don't even think it's going to be a two or three match thing. I think we're going to see him around for a little bit. I wouldn't say that dude's going to sign for three years. But his buddy, Brian Myers, is with the company. I'm sure he's telling him good things. And Brian Myers has a good status within the company so far. And um, this is a good thing for Impact because recently they talked about the, the top 20, maybe, pro wrestling tees. Uh, sellers for the year for 2020 um, not uh, one impact star was in that top 20 but what was every company had a representative even ring of honor uh Danhausen was in there who what what was in the top 20 was brian myers and um matt curdo on his podcast that did make the top 20 so it's in their best interest to have a guy like this i've talked about he you know he's, he's a dude with a cult following so i think he's a guy you kind of want around I don't think they're going to team him up with Brian Myers by any stretch. Uh, X Division match. We had Chris Bay, Manic, Rohit Raju. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. This was such a good X Division match. The X Division has been close to being dead quite a few times over the, over the years. They don't even have enough people for the X Division. You know, I, I've joked that there's more people in the Dark Order in AW than there's in the entire X Division in Impact. And X Division, they're always multi-man matches. Usually don't do much for me. But over the last year or so, they've been doing a good job with storylines when it comes to the X Division Championship. And this was one I didn't like how it started, where Rohi was a champion, but he was losing all the time. Well, he was losing a bunch before he won the championship, but then he still continued to lose. There was hot shotting of the title. You know, Willie Mack had it, and then Chris Bay had it, and then Rohi had it. You know what I mean? And then, you know, Manic won it. It was just... We've had about five X Division champions. Uh, I think we had five different ones in 2020. Like, that's that's a little much for me. This match uh, kind of reminded me of old X Division matches, like back in the days. Like, this was excellent. They gave Rohit an opportunity to really show what he could do out there. You know, they played into the storyline a little bit. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of fuckery on this pay-per-view, and that's what I really like. Like, even with Bound for Glory... There was, you know, bullshit finishes and, you know, Josh Matthews with, oh, so-and-so steals one and this and, like, this match, th this pay-per-view, you know, you can call the spraying the mist kind of a bullshit finish, but it wasn't that important of a match. Like, these were legit wins, legit wins, legit wins that meant something. Like, this, I I'm telling you, this pay-per-view, dude, even, they even put hard to kill in the fucking turnbuckles. They didn't even do that for Bound for Glory, so... Um, I just I can't say enough good about this pay-per-view. You know, I'm someone who who finds a lot of small faults and things, and I and I you know I kind of nitpick small little things like, yo, this pay-per-view right here. Again, if you if you watch this and you're like, oh, this this shows this pay-per-view is bullshit. Like, you you're just hating because these kind of matches, you'll see these matches on AEW or whatever NXT. Like, these matches were good. These were good matches. This was a good pay-per-view. But Manic gets the win here, uh, beats Rohit. Usually in these triple threats, wh whoever win gets pinned by... No, actually, I shouldn't say that. Um, I say I would say in this scenario, because Ro uh, usually the person who doesn't get pinned continues in the storyline. I think in this situation that Rohit was the one pinned, I think he's going to continue in the storyline with Manic. But I would like to see them do something else, both of them. Uh... Ty Valkyrie versus Deanna Parazzi, you know, knockouts, the knockouts title matches, usually the pay-per-view, are one of the show stealers. I wouldn't say this was one of the show stealers because the whole fucking card was just good. The matches were just good up and down. There was nothing to me where I was like, oh my god, you know, like it was just all solid. It all meant something. Deanna Parazzo and Ty, though, put on the show that you would expect them to put on. After this match, Deanna, she did win. She uh, did submit Taya. In a very believable manner, I, I don't know what's in, I don't know what is in store for Ty going forward. I don't know what else she could do. 
You know, you know what I mean? Unless she was going to knock it, compete for the tag team titles. But um, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not getting uh, warm fuzzies about Taya's future in the company. But she made uh, Deanna really look like a star with the submission victory, and this was this was just this was a good match. Also, like like I just can't can't uh, can't stress it enough. This was just a good pay per view. Uh, what do we have to that? The Karate Man versus Page. I thought it was kind of silly. There's many of you who probably were very entertained by it. I, I thought it was entertaining, but it was bad at the same time. Karate Man. I mean, it was just so silly. I mean. Thank God it didn't go that long. You know what I mean? It was almost like a bad video game. But the Karate Man wins. He pulled out Ethan Page's heart. He said in... Um, if you go to Wiki, Wikipedia, it says that Karate Man won by murder. They've... I think it's clear Ethan Page is probably going to end up in NXT. Um, I don't know how competitive of an offer Impact made to him. But I know that he had a number in his head... You know, based on interviews and everything, I think he knew what his worth was, his perceived worth, and I think Impact didn't meet that number or come close. Um, I think he's been knowing for a while that he was going to leave. He got rid of all, you know, his, his website, all his merchandise. It seemed like he's getting away from the name Ethan Page, which makes sense that they killed him off on the show. They killed off Ali at one point, you know, so they killed him off. It was, it was silly to me. Like, this is the way you want to go down, but I guess it kind of makes sense. If he's starting a new chapter in his career, if he's going to have a new silly name, like, you know, Wesley, like, <laughs> Des has an NXT, Desmond Xavier, like, you know. So, who knows? We'll see. I thought the match was kind of silly. I'm glad it wasn't that long. Uh, Eddie Edwards versus Sammy Callahan. Yo, this barbed wire massacre match right here, fire. Phenomenal. The last barbed wire massacre match I think they had was OVE versus LAX, and it was good. It was a, a little gimmicky, but it, but it was good. It was entertaining. Like this was a barbed wire massacre match. The ones we think that Abyss was in, and and, and these dudes like there was heat, drama, passion, blood. I mean, it was everything that a feud should be in wrestling. And the match absolutely delivered. This was so effing good. And if you guys remember, Sammy Callahan actually kind of won this feud back when they were when they were hot. And then they got away from it. They didn't overkill it like they did with Tessa Blanchard a couple of years ago where she, you know, they just put her in our face 24-7. They let that feud breathe because they knew they could revisit it at any time that they wanted. And um, they... Knock this out the park. They nailed this. This is what a barbed wire massacre match should be. And even though we're in a kinder, gentler wrestling world right now, where they don't want to show blood and guts and, and, and all that shit, yo, Eddie Edwards gets the win here. And I don't know where they're going to go forward, go, um, you know, going forward with each of these guys. But wow, this was amazing. And then the main event was uh, Rich Swan, Moose. Now, Moose stepped in for Alex Shelley. For, he had personal matter. I don't know what it was. I did try to look into it, but uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, just not information I'm privy to. But uh, Chris Saban, uh, Moose, and Rich Swan against Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers. So this match started off kind of slow. I wasn't knowing what to expect. I fully expected Kenny Omega to win. I had said on... Uh, the Cool Factor podcast that if if it'll take making a fool of their their own guys or Rich Swan as the champion in order for Impact to get cool with the AEW folks, they'll do it. You know, I felt like that was going to happen. There there was no way in my mind that Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers were going to lose this match. With this being said, this this the way they built this match, with the exception of Josh Matthews and his being annoying about it. The way they built the match made me really care about who won. I really wanted Rich Swan and his team to win. Usually, I'm watching a match, and, okay, I want this person to win or whatever. Like, I was emotionally invested in this to where, you know, these guys were getting their butt whipped every you know, week on TV. And, but, I, but I had a good feeling they were going to lose. But I wanted them to win. I was emotionally invested in it, and that's good wrestling. So... 
Yes, Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers did win. But they made Swan and Moose. Moose established himself as a superstar in this match. But they made him and uh, Swan and Moose. They, they got a lot of offense in. This wasn't a, you know, they're getting their butt kicked the whole match and then end up losing. You know what I mean? It was very back and forth. And I really think Swan and his team really showed what they could do to anyone who is really tuning in to the pay-per-view who doesn't normally buy Impact pay-per-views. Moose really showed what he can do. If you know Moose, Moose is in that like WrestleMania mindset that he's always going to bring something for the pay-per-views that you don't see from him. He's always been like this since he's been a part of Impact. It didn't matter what, you know, uh, what, what part of, you know, the dark days of TNA or, or Impact Wrestling. Now he always delivers at the pay-per-views. I can't believe I can't believe they left Moose off this pay per view. He, they're so lucky that he was able to sub in for Alex Shelley, and you know what? I'm glad he did because Doc Gallows is huge. You like imagine three pretty much cruiserweights on one side against you know three larger dudes. Kenny, I didn't know Kenny Omega was that much bigger than Rich Swan. Like he made Rich Swan look tiny out there. Kenny's bigger than I thought he was. Imagine it was Alex Shelley out there too. Three little dudes basically against three bigger dudes. Like, yeah, Carl Anderson's not, you know, the biggest dude in the world, but he's not tiny either, you know? So I thought actually Moose Moose was a good inclusion. I feel really bad for Alex Shelley that he wouldn't get to be a part of this monumental match, but this was everything um, I expected it to be. It, you know, it wasn't that, you know, five-star Kenny Omega, but he, you know, he was he wrestled a little safer because he's obviously wrestling on someone else's uh, program. He was a little safer, but you know the match was was a, was really good, and um, it sucked for me as a fan seeing Rich Swan get pinned at the end from the one winged angel. So uh, who knows? Uh, I've been told there's some more surprises coming, and um, we'll see. I'm glad that they didn't have you know John Moxley run out there or anything because I don't want to see them further an AEW storyline on on Impact. Because when the Good Brothers showed up the other day on AEW, they didn't bring Rich Swan and, you know, Chris Saban. They, they didn't show up on the show. Like, instead, they made it... They barely name-dropped Impact, and then they made it about AEW. Like, they showed up on AEW show to further AEW storylines. So I was a little disappointed with that and not seeing Impact get that representation. I hope Rich Swan now shows up on Dynamite in one way, shape, or form. It sucks seeing our champion get pinned, but that's just the way it is. The pay-per-view was an A+. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You guys know me. I criticize a lot with Impact because when I when I really think something is good, I want you to know that I mean it and that it matters. I'm, I don't just say everything's bad. I don't say everything's good. There's a lot of people who think I'm negative. Again, I am honest because when I say something is good, I want you to know that coming from my mouth, I mean it. Thanks for checking me out, guys. We're going to do a full review on the Cool Factor podcast very soon. I will talk to you guys soon. Peace.